Hey everybody, I'm Danny Rosenthal, uh, the community engagement strategist with Engine Hire. So I'm so glad everybody's engaged right now. Uh, thank you all, everybody, for like joining us on our webinar with Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, yeah, I was really excited about this. Jennifer Lawrence has been in the industry for 20 years. I have all my notes. Uh, she's the president of Luxury Lifestyle Logistics. It, she has a bachelor's and master's in hospitality, a graduate of Protocol School of Washington, and the Charles McPherson Butler and Household Management Academy. Um, from here, I mean, like, first of all, that's pretty amazing. Uh, a master's? Come on. Um, but yeah, I'm going to toss it over to Jennifer and let her tell us more about herself and get everything going. Well, thank you, Daniel and Engine Hire for this opportunity. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Well, yes, um, absolutely. Very, very pleased to have you all on the call today. Um, again, so my name is Jen Lawrence. Um, I'm an estate management consultant. I serve high net worth individuals in their homes to help them run their properties more effectively. Um, and I've been in the world of private service for over 20 years, 23 years to be exact. I found out about private service when I was 17 years old at a professionally managed estate, and I have never looked back. So um I decided that this was going to be my life's path. I did an amazing undergrad at a small independent women's college that specialized in domestic service. It wasn't specifically a domestic service degree, but the undercurrent of the conversation, um, because it was um, a women's college, was how do we professionalize the art of home management? How do we bring that hospitality sense into the work environment? Um, and how do we cross the two? And so it was a really unique um, entry into this lifestyle. And through that, I got my first internships in the in the industry. I was a nanny manager, a household manager, um, a house manager, housekeeper, and then an estate manager. And for the first 10 years of my career, um, as I was working, I did go to the Protocol School of Washington in Washington, D.C. for etiquette, protocol, and safety and security training. And then I also did um, the Charles McPherson Academy for butlers and household managers. So it was an incredible gateway into this um, career and this lifestyle. So I've always been on the household management and estate management side. I know with agencies, there's this divide of kind of the family care management and estate management from pretty much from an estate manager's pers perspective, we don't see that divide. We don't kind of delegate the household management duties from the family care management duties. And I'll get into the, a little bit that about that today. Um, but through my work um, in domestic service, I decided that there was um, a lot of deficiency and inefficiency in training um, and really understanding the nav the navigating the complexities of this really um, tumultuous work environment it can be a very tumultuous work environment. So I decided to um, pivot and I started my own consultancy 13 years ago. So that's when I opened Luxury Lifestyle Logistics. And what I do is I sell my time in weeks to a family that is struggling, is struggling to um, maintain their household staff, to delegate effectively. And I go in and I really create a third party operational assessment to help that family understand that they're running their home as if it were a business now. And even though it's a family care and personal management environment, they have to create systems and standards and practices so that they can delegate effectively to their team in order to step away and step back and be the guest in their own home instead of the manager of it. Um, so when you get into the upper echelons of households that are considered high net worth and ultra high net worth, they really want their home to run like a Four Seasons or a Ritz Carlton, this five star working environment where everything runs like clockwork, but they're tied to the de delegation of every aspect of it because A, it's a personal work environment, B, they feel intricately involved with every single management aspect of their household because it's their home. And so they really can't divorce themselves from the managerial aspect of running their estate. And they're not able to really enjoy the lifestyle they've created and be a guest in their own environment. And so this um, plays out through trying to create a hospitality environment that they're managing, but then also trying to enjoy. And it's like they go behind the fourth wall, like at the theater, you know, you can't be an actor and enjoying the play at the same time. So this is where I come in. I help them set up these systems and processes so that the staff can be more effective to, um, to take ownership and responsibility over their daily operational aspects, but then the owners can be free to enjoy the lifestyle they've created instead of managing it. So what that looks like is I will go in a week at a time and I will work with the agencies that 
um, refer me to these households. So an agent is my best referral source. And when I get a call from an agency and they say, Jen, I'm getting these calls from this household, their nanny's not working out well, they're fighting with their chef, they can't get dinner on the table on time, you know, the, the staff is kind of in chaos and they're all reporting to Mr. and Mrs. and Mr. and Mrs. are really frustrated. Um, well, then I can come in and give you as the agent more understanding as to the, the dynamics of what's going on in the home, but also I, because I see their week and I see the operational needs that they're having throughout the week as like kind of a bar rescue or a super nanny, if you guys have, has anyone ever watched those shows? Um, or they go in and they kind of assess what's going on. Um, because I'm there and I'm holding not only the staff's hand, but also the owner's hand, I'm able to speak truth to power to the staff, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to the owners in a way that um, you're not necessarily able to unless you're on site. And so this is why I opened my consulting practices because um, every family is idiosyncratic. Every family is different. The Jones family is not gonna run the same way as the Smith family is not going to run the same way as the Washington family. You could have three families on one street and they all operate very differently. And we know that because intuitively we understand that they're different households. But when you think about it in your own life and how your in-laws run their household very differently than your household, um, how could you possibly put a domestic worker into an environment with no training, no manual, no understanding of how this family operates and articulate those needs um, in a professional way. And then they're really kind of, you know, deer in the headlights, right? So the owners are feeling the same thing and the um, workers are feeling the same thing. And nobody can talk about it because there's an imbalance of power here. The um, imbalance of power is, is that it's not a traditional work environment, it's someone's home. And so there's already this line of discretion and decorum that you can't cross. And really, um, you can't tell people what to do in their own home. You know, that's like an imbalance of power there. And so the workers come in with their shiny manuals and their shiny binders of all these systems and practices that they want to engage with, with the employers. And the employers are like, we don't want to institutionalize our home. This is our place of, you know, rest. This is our respite away from the world. So you're, you're coming up all against all of these organizational behavior challenges. Um, and so I'm actually doing a PhD in organizational behavior management and leadership theory in estate management. So if I am successful, cross my fingers, it may be one of the first dissertations in this work um, in the published academic, uh, academic world. So this is why I'm so passionate about um, divulging and dissecting the communication challenges within estate management, um, speaking truth to power, and you're not going to solve every communication challenge with a magic wand, and there's no textbook, and there's no five steps to better communication. I, I, I really just kind of want to dissuade everybody from thinking that there's a magic cookie cutter approach, because there are 7 billion people in the world. There are probably four or five billion families, and they all operate very differently because of these layers of sociology, psychology, faith, environment, you know, family generational issues. All of these things are so complex when you think about um, a domestic work environment. And then for the majority of you, you're placing nannies um, who are caring for their most precious asset, their loved ones, their children. Um, and how do you instill um, a better, positive, more working relationship with the nanny and the mom when, you know, she might not want to delegate her motherly duties to an outside person. Um, and, and she might not articulate that, but internally she's feeling the guilt and the shame of, of giving those roles and responsibilities over to a, um, a secondary person. So what I can do today with the time that we have, um, and Daniel, how much time do we have? Are we stopping right at the hour? We, I think the, probably the hour is best. <laughs> okay. So I just kind of want to budget our time. What I can do is I can go through some of these complex um, academic um, thought processes um, and tell you what the literature says in terms of how this is such an idiosyncratic work environment and why communication is so challenging. Um, but that's not necessarily going to get us to the, like, the how to solve it. What it does is it sheds light on it in a way that doesn't feel anecdotal anymore. Anymore because my passion in this industry is that everything feels anecdotal and your nannies and your housekeepers and your, um, you know, other household staff will come to you and they'll tell you all these anecdotes of all the crazy things that happen with Mr. and Mrs. But until you kind of dissect why that's going on, you can't 
work it backwards and create a system and a process for how to fix that going forward. Um, so I can kind of run through some slides and talk about like the academic literature of it, which if that's what you're in the mood for, great, we can certainly do that. But I would much prefer to kind of open it up and open up the floor um, to discuss what you're hearing um, when nannies and housekeepers and house managers and the owners call you after a successful placement um, and what you say to them and how to walk through the complexities of their working relationship going forward. So we can do a bit of both. I would love to open it up just for like a roundtable discussion, or I can go through some of these slides of the research that I'm focusing on. Um, well, let's take a vote. Um, what, what would everybody prefer? Do you guys want to put it in the chat? You want to raise your hands? I can't see the whole um, gallery screen. Oh yeah, I can. So for the people on the call, use your little, um, use your little raise your hand um, vote feature. Um, if everybody would prefer to go through some of these more academic slides um, on the, the literature and the research of organizational behavior theory in estate management, or so the other option is we kind of open it up and we do a roundtable discussion on um, some of the challenges that you're hearing on the phone and how I could maybe, um, how I would answer some of those for you. So, so who wants to do more of the academic slides and think about the theory of estate management communication? We have one vote for that, two votes for that. Who wants to open up the floor and just in a casual fashion, talk about some of these complexities and how you navigate these conversations on the telephone? Three votes, not everybody's voting, four votes, five five votes, six votes. Okay, Are, do we think that we wanna open up the floor then and just have more of a casual conversation? And I can kind of work in some of the academic literature as needed. Okay, we'll do that, perfect. So um, the floor is yours. Uh, Daniel will help me navigate the the chat, and yeah. if I miss if I miss a question, um, we'll we'll go back. But yes, I'll I'll answer the questions. We'll open up the mics. We'll let people take the stage. Um, we'll just kind of have a roundtable on the communication challenges in estate management. Yeah, I mean Emily has already jumped in before any hand raising was even allowed. Uh, when someone comes to you. Uh, to describe a situation anecdotally, what is your process to dissect what is really the problem? Thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, so first of all, there is, um, I'll, I'll jump in with my favorite academic uh, piece of jargon here. So um, Miranda Fricker is a researcher out of New York, and this um, art, this article is pretty recent. Um, she created um, something called a hermeneutical injustice, versus an epistemic injustice. And so I'll break that down a little bit. A hermeneutical injustice is um, a phenomenon in society where nobody understands um, what is happening to that person or the individual. So the, the academic article references sexual harassment in uh, before the 1970s. So if you've ever watched Mad Men, who's watched Mad Men, the show, um, and you see the um, you see the uh, secretaries and the the workers in the you know, the 50s, and it was kind of a very male dominated environment. And the secretaries were all female, and they would make comments and you know comment about what they were wearing and this and that. Um, and the women didn't have a context or a vernacular to um, explain what was occurring. They just knew that they didn't like how their bosses were referring to them and how they were being treated. Well, until um, the sexual harassment movement in the 1970s um, came to fruition, the women didn't have a voice or vernacular to explain what was happening to them. So Miranda Fricker says that this is a hermeneutical injustice. An epistemic injustice um, would be if the workers themselves don't understand that an injustice is occurring. So um, to take that one step further, and I forget the, the uh, let me see if I can find the, the reference here. Um, uh, Fricker. Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. So then to, to break that down, there's another, um, there's another researcher, forgive me. I can't find her name at the moment. Oh, here it is. Shavasti, Ariane Shavasti, 2018. She wrote an article about domestic service. And she said that it is, she built on Miranda Fricker's work. She said that domestic work is both a hermeneutical injustice and an epistemic injustice because society doesn't understand what it's like to work in a domestic household environment and the workers don't have the vernacular to articulate it themselves. 
Isn't that crazy? So she's saying that of all of the industries that have been studied since the beginning of time, like this is both like, you know, a master servant relationship in the 21st century. How do you, how do you articulate, how do you navigate the complexities of that working relationship and the dialogue that's happening? Um, has anyone, has anyone um, talked to their workers about like, I don't understand, like I, they give you all these anecdotes and then they just say, I don't understand what's going on or I don't know why this is happening. Um, and then again, it's all anecdotal because no one has the vernacular, the voice to articulate what a master servant relationship in the 21st century should look like. I just find that this is really fascinating. So I know that that was a long winded tangent. So let me break down Emily's question a little bit further. They've given you an anecdote because they they can't understand the complexity of what they're trying to articulate. So you have to take the anecdote and remove the anecdote from it and get to the root of the issue. <laughs> so um, the best way that I've found to do this is think about it as if it were not in a domestic service environment, <laughs> excuse me, and, um, and focus on it as if it were in corporate America. Does that make sense to everyone? Excuse me, I'm getting through a little bit of a cough today. Um, because you would never encounter these workplace um, complexities in in a corporate office. If you were dealing with placing accountants, if you were deal dealing with placing, you know, um, receptionists, they would not have the inner complexities of family dynamics, sociology, um, theory of place and space, like you're in their place of space. So there's like this distancing versus uh, embracing mechanism that happens. They, they don't know when they can enter a room or exit a room or they have to exit a room if Mr. or Mrs. are talking. It's a, it's a very uncomfortable work environment in general. And so this is where the staff and the owners feel this um, crux and they get into this place where, um, where no one understands how to just break down the walls of communication and call an elephant an elephant or call you know a spade a spade and just dive into the, the root of the problem. So this is what I love to do. I just love to articulate it for families and say, look, you both are in a weird spot. Um, you know, <laughs> someone is in your home 24 seven. I like to call it the uh, mother-in-law um, syndrome. You know, if you have a mother-in-law and she stays for three days, you kind of want to pull your hair out. Well, let alone a domestic worker. A domestic worker is in your personal space all the time, eight hours a day. And so it can be very exhausting for both the worker and the employer to, um, to navigate that um, for sure. So just remove the anecdote from it. Think about it as if it were a corporate office and how you would professionally um, handle those situations. And I think it takes a lot of the emotion out of it for sure. Thank you for that question. Marilyn, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? No, just wanted to know how to raise your hand. <laughs> totally cool. Hi there. <laughs> um, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Well, Natalie does have a question. She has this scenario for you. Uh, client is not using the Trello board to add tasks to the household manager's to-do list. How would he kindly and respect respectfully approach her to please use the Trello board so that he can best keep track of all the many tasks she adds to him? So this is the employer is not using the preferred method of communication. Is that the scenario? Seems like it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So good luck with that. Yeah. Uh, she was so, she was so happy when he set it up and thought it was mm -hmm. fantastic and used it for a week or two, but then it's just, he comes in daily. She just vomits a list on him and he's like, Whoa, you know? Yeah. So I don't know any advice on how to coach him on how to best and respectfully approach that with her. I would love to say that that is something that we could fix right off the bat. Um, a couple of things. And, and um, Natalie's raising her hand. I'll, I'll throw it to Nat Natalie in a, a minute. Um, Bonnie Lowe Craman is on our board at Private Service Alliance, um, and which is the new board of our professional association. I was so pleased to be with Dima for 10 years. And when Dima deflected and folded, Natalie Hudson took up the the helm and open private service alliances. So now many of us are on the board there um, trying to raise the conversation for all domestic workers in the United States. And um, Bonnie wrote a fabulous book called Staff Matters. Um, and in that, it talks about um, the workplace challenges of working with a difficult boss. The difference in private service is that we cannot send our bosses to training. 
We cannot send the owners to training as we would in corporate America. In corporate America, you would have an HR department and you would tell your HR department that the workload is unreasonable. The communication um, uh, avenues are taking up more time than the task itself, which is the issue of the initial question. Um, and so then you would go and you would talk to HR about um, having your boss be more reasonable. Well, there is no HR department in private service, unfortunately. And so this is why um, an estate worker has to wear many hats and be extremely adaptable and extremely thick skinned in order to um, roll with the punches. What I would tell the domestic worker is um, that they have to be able to politely articulate that in monthly meetings and continue to bring it up in a polite way until the owner gets it. So this is what I would do if, if I were the estate manager. I would say, well, thank you for the list of 187 things you sent me this month. Here are the metrics with no emotion attached to them. These were the 27 things I got done. These were the 13 things I wasn't able to get done. And the reason I wasn't able to get these things done is unfortunately I was transcribing your sticky notes, emails, voicemails, and um, verbal directions you gave me this month. You gave me 87 verbal directions, 47 you know, emails, 22 sticky notes, and 14 um, whatever. And I would literally have them write and highlight um, a metrics chart of the communication styles on the estate. And that's the only way politely an owner is going to realize, hey, buddy, if I don't use the Trello board that they set up and really start to streamline this, I'm going to work this worker out of a position and she or he is going to go find somewhere else to work that's more reasonable. Um, you would hope that the light bulb moment would go on. Um, Certainly you can call me if it doesn't. And I'm more than happy to have that conversation with the employer because the problem is that the employer sometimes takes their mask off at the end of the day when they walk through the doors of their home. When they walk through the doors of their home, they don't want to think in corporate speak or corporate terms anymore. They're reasonable people. And if you had told them that in, in an office environment, they would have been like, of course, I'll use the Google Teams or the Slack or whatever method of communication we're using, but this is my home. So I just want to scream a order as I'm walking out the door like I do for my wife, right? So that is not a professional method of communication. And so if we're going to elevate the conversation for the owners and really help them understand that they are running a business now and their home is a workplace environment, it, even though it is their still place of residence, um, they're never going to have that light bulb moment. And so this is the conversation that I love to have with employers and help them to see that if they just elevate the standards of professionalization in their home a little bit more, they're able to overcome some of those communication challenges. Um, did that answer the initial question? And then Natalie, did you want to comment further on, on that topic? Who's, whose initial yeah, question was it? I'm sorry. It was mine. The other Natalie. Okay. The other Natalie. Oh, Natalie yeah. Hudson and Natalie. What's your name, Natalie? Anillo. Natalie, Natalie Anillo. Anillo. What agency are you with, Natalie? Uh, mom's best friend, Dallas. Mom's best friend, Dallas. Welcome. Welcome. So happy to have you. Yeah. yeah. yeah thanks for well, your response. Both Natalie's, you guys can take it away. <laughs> All right. Um, having worked in private service myself for over 25 years as a live-in nanny all the way to estate manager, managing multiple properties for one family. Um, I learned at the International Butler Academy that my mantra became, uh, there's 26 ways to get from A to Z and what matters most is the way my principal needs it done today, which can be different from last week, next month, and tomorrow. Um, the um, every, every private service professional needs to become a chameleon in adapting to their environment. Um, they don't get to set the tone of the house. They don't get to set a lot of the parameters. They need to become a chameleon and they need to, and even though a principal might say, yes, I, this is my preferred method of communication, there, the proof might not be in that, in that they communicate in three other ways much more frequently or um, effectively than they do their official preferred communication. Um, and so just because um, I, I totally endorse using whatever tools work for the private service professional, but you may need to edit that to in correspondence back to the principal. And Danny, if you've shared my screen, I can, um, oh, I, uh, can you share my screen or not? Or can I? I can't really set it up in this format right now. Okay. All right. So um, I was going to share a, um, maybe I'll throw a copy in the 
the chat. Um, the um, so I, I I kept a you know this is before Trello existed. I had running spreadsheets of di for different um, topics. You know, like the operations, the fleet management, the entertaining and stuff. And so I had all these different spreadsheets. And as different tasks rolled in, I color coded them and then I tag them and stuff. But then every week at the end of the week on Friday, because my bosses like to communicate to me over the weekend on their down downtime. But unless they actually texted me a message for a specific item, I didn't look at that the the responses until Monday when I was back in the house. And um, those responses I would take and I would plug it into my system. I do it. And then, um, but that weekly email that I would send at the end of the week was called the weekly recap. I'd set a date. The first section had um, vendors next week, like who's expected on property on what day and why. Um, the next section said, and I had one of those for each of the properties. So there was five next week vendors listed. Um, then I had um, um, a logistics that I need to know about next week. So I'd have questions or input needed. And I'd put, start it with the first initial of the principal that I was specific, specifically speaking to. So in this form, I have J. Um, I put colon waiting, uh, waiting reply to email regarding soccer on that date. Um, S, first storage, as in fur coats, uh, which pieces need to be cleaned this year and how many pieces uh, to store. Then I have an order by list of here's what I've ordered. Um, you know, and if they want to add something else to the to the procurement list, they were able to do that. Um, then I had what's going on then under next week and next month. I had our ongoing project list, and uh, and if they if anything had changed, it was you know noted that you know this is an update. And then um, with a list of, of homes, and then I had um, what I worked on this week, a list of everything that I worked on that week, and if it had an X in front of it it was com considered completed and it would fall off of next week's recap. So, um, and then I had a handyman list that once we had X number of items on the handyman list per property, then, um, you know, we call the handyman and say, okay, I need these seven things fixed. And I had an on hold section and then, a, and then a seasonal section of, you know, come spring, I'm going to do this, this, and this summer, I'm going to do this, this, this fall, and then winter. So it was very, um, but they could, they could skim through it if any part of it interested them, you know, that where I needed questions or input, it was flagged, um, you know, and just, I had to, you know, I had to meet them where they were most effective and where I could cut to the chase and just get the answers that I needed and yet keep them abreast of what, so, so using Trello might just be, they might have all the, all the uh, interest in the world to do it, but they might not have the bandwidth to make it happen. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. I might need to pick your brain some more later, but thank you. Happy to. Um, there's a, a Calendly link on the bottom of my website. You can make an appointment at any time. Oh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Oh, you're still muted now. Thank you so much. Thanks both Natalie's for participating in that question. Um, let's take another question from the audience. Well, I, I'll jump in with one sure. while everybody ruminates. Uh, like, what is the most common topic that you actually find having to, you know, work out with people? The number one um, problem in private service is communication. So that's the reason why we're all on this call. And the reason that communication is so challenging in this work environment is because of sociology issues, psychology issues, family firm, knowledge theory transfer issues. Um, so that just means that it's a mom and pop environment and everything is idiosyncratic because it's a family. It's idiosyncratic because of psychology. It's idiosyncratic because of gender studies. It's idiosyncratic because of family firm theory. Um, and all of these complexities are layers of an onion that cannot be um, dissected before you get into the work environment. Um, there is no way to research a family before you Put a, put a person in a position or before the person accepts the position. You know, if normal um, recruiters say, hey, you're going to go, um, you know, get a job with Google, go research that department with Google, go reach out to someone and, and um, you know, take them out to coffee if you're going to have that position um, going forward. So 
it doesn't work that way in private service. And so my passion, my heart is to um, dissect the complexities of communication, um, explain that we're in a 21st century work environment and, you know, excusing bad behavior of bad bosses and bad organizational leadership doesn't um, work in the 21st century hospitality um, world. And so how can we you know, navigate the complexities of that while also elevating standards and professionalizing things so that we don't have to spin 40 plates and, you know, have these um, situations, butt heads where um, the owners and the staff are frustrated. Um, because ultimately, as agents, you've made a good placement. You have a person with a caring heart, a wonderful spirit. They want to work in private service because of that interpersonal connectivity. Um, they could go, you know, nanny at a childcare center. They could go be a teacher where it's much less personal, but for some reason, their heart is drawn to working in a family because they want to edify a, an actual family and ha help them be the cog in the, the life that keeps their family turning. On the household management side, even if you're at a five-star level service environment, you could go be at the Four Seasons, you could go be the Ritz Carlton. And quite honestly, it's a much easier work environment than taking on and shouldering the burden of responsibility for a family. Um, and so it's, it's you know, we I think we have to start pivoting the conversation to 21st century standards. Um, you know, we can't think about the master servant and domestic service relationship as if it were 100 years ago. Um, I get a lot of questions from, you know, the world of Daunton Abbey and upstairs, downstairs and things like that. Well, people didn't have options then. Um, you know, they worked in private service because their parents worked in private service and their parents before them worked in private service. Um, at the heart of the Edwardian area, uh, the heart of the Edwardian era, um, there were more people in private service than there were in any other service sector, agriculture, industrial um, you know, there were more jobs in private service before World War One than anywhere else. And so obviously, you know, because of history and wealth and, and stature and all these things that have happened over the last hundred years, you know, we've pivoted. And so now there are a hundred jobs that people could choose um, when they, when they, you know, turn 18. So why do they want to be in private service? I mean, that is, I think the nature of it, and until we start elevating the conversation to 21st century standards, um, we're not going to get out of this crazy making cycle that we all feel that we're on. So that is my goal. That is the heart of my mission is to elevate the professionalization standards for both the domestic worker and the employer. Ashley, I know that you raised your hand. Do you want to ask your question? And then I, know I would. You thank you. Um, I could. I have a question just about the topic, right? Communication between clients and, and nannies um, or domestic employees. And my question, we really, we've been seeing a lot of issues with maybe clients not being super upfront about special needs and then a nanny getting into the home and being totally blindsided. Um, you know, it's kind of brushed off the shoulder. And even when it's brought up in a professional, you know, tame conversation, it's still not really being addressed. It's just like, oh, well, why would he act that way? You know, why would this happen? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's hard from an agency because we're we're not a fly on the wall. We don't, you know, there are two sides to every story, of course. But um, I'm seeing this happen quite often. And, and, and so it's that issue and just an overall, overall issue of a, just, um, you know, people coming to us, which I do prefer, but just not being able to like, address anything in the home in a professional way or just you know not not even be opening open to having a conversation um but any any guidance or words you have to part on that subject would be appreciated thank you that is such a hard um one to navigate so there's a couple different layers there um the layer of the family doesn't want to admit maybe to themselves that there's a special needs issue the second issue is is that they don't want to um uh give a, a voice and a path forward for how to solving it because maybe they don't want to admit that there is an issue. Um, and then thirdly, it's that it's that thing that I was discussing about um, the parental guilt that they're feeling um, in someone navigating the rearing of that child and how you go about the professionalization of rearing someone else's child on their behalf um, and having a close working relationship with the parents 
so that they're all on the same page. Because if a parent undermines the authority with an with a nanny, um, it can be detrimental to their working relationship, and it's detrimental to the respect that the child is going to give the nanny um, in order to have that be a professional relationship with the nanny in her charge. So um, first and foremost, I think that it's really important to get out of uh, ahead of the situation. And as you're onboarding a family, um, and if they're new, you know, on your roster, I think that's the perfect time to kind of have some of these crucial conversations. So what I would do with um, a client is I would just say to the owners, because really, again, we can come in with all of our shiny manuals and shiny ways that, you know, our um, childhood education degrees, even, you know, a nanny can have four years in childhood education, and she can come in with all these systems and practices and theory. And if a family is not going to be willing to come to the table and meet her in um, her professionalization of that work environment, well, then there's really, you know, there's nothing you can do. So my best advice is you as the agent, you as, um, you know, the manager in the situation needs to tell the owners on, from the get-go that this working relationship is about the child first and foremost. And so by being on the same page and, um, understanding that you're not at odds with your domestic worker, that we're all here for the same reason. It's important to um, call a spade a spade and get out ahead of it rather than trying to backpedal because then it becomes a blame game. Then it's like, well, the nanny did this and I, and my child's perfect, you know, and I don't want to um, get in the middle of all of that. So right from the contractual, um, you know, meeting, I would say, if there are behavioral issues, if there are challenges, if there are special needs that that need to be addressed, how would you like for me to handle that? You know, and I want to come at a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting. Um, and it's so, so important that that relationship continue to be professional because the minute it breaks down in communication, the nanny's looking for a new job. And I'm sure you all have been in that environment where the behavioral issues and the communication challenges and the special needs were not addressed. And then ultimately just became a toxic work environment. And now the nanny's looking for a new job. And the child is really the loser in the situation because like the parents don't want to address the issue. The nanny sees what's going on and she can't fix the brokenness of that household. And then she feels defeated. So it, it's a very complex situation. Um, so the first thing, and really the only thing I would say is that if they're going to listen, they're going to listen on the front end and you have to have that conversation right from the get-go. Thank you. And just to confirm, when you say listen on the front end, you mean the agency side whenever we're doing like a client intake essentially? Yes. And I, I would, I would have the behavioral communication conversation right from the onboarding of that, um, owner relationship. Um, okay. and I think that that's the only way they're going to be receptive because you have them where you want them. They need a nanny from you. And so in order to comply and be good clients, they have to listen to what you have to say. <laughs> so it might be the only time that they're going to be receptive before they become defensive. Right? right. So this is, this is where I would have that conversation with them in the onboarding process. Okay. And we have, I mean, we have a spot for honor application it's just, it can be such a taboo subject matter. You know, it's, it's a difficult conversation to have. And sometimes we don't feel we have the place to. So I usually just let them explain what they want to explain. But now, as you're saying, and as we're seeing, you know, that can retroactively hurt us and, and the nanny and the family and the child. So there's so many that. taboo subjects in this industry. Uh, my God, it, you, thank you. Yes, <laughs> there's taboo subjects on COVID, we all lived through it. You know, if there's a viral pandemic running through your household, does my domestic worker have to show up for work, you know? So um, there's A to Z nanny contract. I can't remember her name. Does anyone remember that um, gal's name? Um, she has a list of all of these topics and it is ever changing. And I think that it's a great intake form that agencies can use as well to have those crucial, crucial conversations with the owners from the get-go. Um, you know, if there's illness, if there's a behavioral issue that arises, if there is um, a, an injury that happens to the child and they become uh, special needs through no fault of their own. You know, a 12 year old gets hit with a baseball to the side of the head and, you know, God forbid is um, now you're dealing with appointments and all those types of things. So um, in the life of a family, there is death, divorce, drug addiction, special needs, outside influences, all of these complexities are so, so incredibly nuanced. And this is where um, something that I learned in Butler school, um, I went to a different Butler school than Natalie did. I went to Charles McPherson, but he said, 
stay professional and you will never go wrong. And so that's the advice that I would give the nanny is to make sure that she's always coming with a um, an air and a sophistication about the way that she addresses topics with her owners and say, Mr. and Mrs., I noticed X, Y, Z with your son. I noticed X, Y, Z with your daughter. How can we work together on this? You know, collaborative vocal um, efforts instead of like an us versus them scenario. So um, we have to train our owners to be more empathetic and um, communicative and come to the table on hot topics when, you know, their domestic workers are trying to just navigate the complexities of their work environment. And we have to train the domestic workers to navigate all of the ins and outs of this very tumultuous work environment with grace and dignity um, and coming to the table so that they, you know, ultimately don't get burned in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in trying to my best to go for everyone to go in order, Emily asked, how can agencies do a better job of educating our clients on the realities of these interpersonal conflicts? Thank you. That is a great question. Again, I think the intake form is really your best um, or your intake session is the best option for you to start to have some of these crucial conversations with the owners. And um, as a team within your agencies, what you can do is talk about the anecdotes at your weekly staff meetings that come up. And instead of getting tied to the emotions of the anecdote, you can break down what that anecdote is referring to and make that a point on your intake form. I think that that's a great um, methodology for um, having some of these conversations up front before they become a problem. Does that sound like something that your agencies can do in terms of talking through um, some of the challenges of this workplace environment? Who has who has a, a great intake um, form that they use? I mean, what's the intake process with some of your families? Um, are your agencies thinking about um, not only getting the wants, wishes, and desires of the owners and the staff, you know, to match like the matchmaking process, but that actual onboard training of both parties through these conversations. Um, does anybody have a form and a checklist and a system that they go through to help owners think about some of these hot topics? Well, I'll volunteer for a webinar going forward and we can all create one together. <laughs> um, I think that this is really important because the agencies are the first line of defense in this entire industry. So while you may not be um, in the home and a fly on the wall, um, you are the only meeting point between this entire operation. So you are effectively the HR department and you only have one shot to make a great first impression, you know, with um, that matchmaking process but you only have one shot to set up your client and your domestic worker for success. Um, and again, because they're going to listen to you at that moment, because they want something from you, they want a human being to come into their house and, you know, navigate all of this. So um, in order to kind of set up the conversation for success for years to come, I think it's, I think it is the, the onus on the agents to, um, to make sure that that conversation goes well. Natalie. And once you have that meeting and come up with those uh, ideas, I am happy to add it to Private Service Alliance's website. Um, we are a source for you guys as the um, as I look at Private Service Alliance as the umbrella organization over all of private service. And if you go to our website, privateservicealliance.com, um, under the empl principal employer, there's a list of tabs for um, A, we offer some consulting services. Jennifer is one of our consultants. Um, key stakeholders. I talk about who's who in the private service industry. Then I have staff titles. So to help you guys differentiate between who's who's get who's who under the roof and or in the mansion, and you know what their education should be, what their what their benefits should be, what their pay should be locally or well in the U.S. and all of that kind of stuff. Um, then I have tips on employing staff, meaning. I, I say, you know, they can do self-directed searches. They can do um, searches through their HR department, but those aren't necessarily the most uh, productive or the most um, uh, long lasting. And I really promote using an agency in there as well. Um, I talk about fair and legal pay, what the employee benefit packages should be in 2023. There's a standard package that everyone should require. And then there's additional ones if they really want to woo better candidates. 
Uh, I've got a staff staff code of ethics and then letters to new employers about, you know, losing that guilt and handing off the things they don't have time to do or don't love to do to professionals who live, breathe and eat private service. Uh, Yvonne Joy, do you have a question? I do. Thank you. So I wanted to know what are your preferred methods for fostering great communication from the beginning, particularly for families who have busy and variable schedules and who prefer a hands-off approach? So um, set time on particular days per week don't work, but then what we've seen happen is that the conversations don't get had or the um, worker is sending a long email and then the parent may or may not be annoyed that they're getting a long email. Um, so that's one question. And then after that, how do you encourage families who are not inclined to communicate grievances to do so. We have written scripts to aid the parents and nannies in um, communicating the grievances, but we do find that sometimes um, the scripts aren't used for various reasons. Wow, thank you so much. That was an excellent question. Um, I'm going to start with the first question. Um, so communication is um, difficult and obviously because of all the complexity, but also because they are passing off effectively their lives to someone else. And um, all of the intricacies of that are hard to navigate if you are tied to the delegation process of every single conversation. And so this is delegation theory and agency theory. Um, in like a substitutionary um, way. And so I, I have some academic um, research on this. What that means basically is um, agency theory states that if I give you a task, I need you to have the decision-making rights in order to fulfill that task um, effectively. The problem in domestic service is that we don't frame that conversation in a way that helps the worker go, you know, they, they're given the information to go one mile, but they're not given the information to go three miles. So then every single time a similar conversation arises, they haven't built on the framework of the communication process. And then the owners feel like they're tied to every decision-making process. And I've seen owners do two things. I've seen owners um, be extremely um, micromanaging, and then they want to get in the process of every decision-making outcome or they're extremely busy and they forego the weekly or monthly meetings altogether with their staff member. And they say, you figure it out. I don't have time for this. And subconsciously what they're saying is, I've already addressed this issue and I haven't realized it, but now I don't want to have the conversation again. So this is why they're not prioritizing monthly or weekly meetings. They're pushing off communication. And what is really happening is, is that they're not creating a framework for the domestic worker to be effective with that decision-making process going forward. So what I would do in that is um, I think of it as a three-prong approach. I think about whatever forms of communication that they prefer, be it email, Trellio, sticky notes, verbal directions. I think there's like 11 that I've listed out previously. Um, all of the methods of communication go on to a calendaring system. So every directive has to have a date, a place, and a time in which it's done. So that's essentially project management. And the third piece of that is the manual. So the, the household manual is how we take those processes and move them forward systematically so that we don't have to make the decision every single time it arises. Let's say, I always love to use this analogy. Um, did anyone see The Devil Wears Prada with Anne Hathaway? Um, it's a great domestic service movie. She's running through the streets of New York. She's got the Starbucks order. She's got the dog. She's trying to pick up the dry cleaning, you know, and she's text messing text messaging her boss frantically. Well, when you get into estate management and the managerial aspects of trying to manage these households, it's very much that way. The problem arises when a junior level associate doesn't understand how to get the Starbucks order correct if Starbucks is out of the one thing the owner asked. And so then a nanny, a estate manager, a housekeeper, it doesn't matter if they've not been given the direction to go one mile, two miles, or three miles for the decision-making process for the owner, they get frozen. And then they're text messaging her frantically. And they're like, I don't know what to do. Starbucks is out of soy milk. The Target is out of your favorite diapers. Well, okay, let's pause there, you know? So whatever communication, so the three-prong approach, whatever communication method the owners prefer, 
email, delegation, sticky notes, et cetera. They're going to give them a directive. We're out of diapers. We're out of soy milk, whatever it may be. When do I need it by? What is the deadline? Well, that's the commun- that's the calendaring effective. That's project management. Not only when do I need it by, but when am I going to get it done? So now we've got to schedule out the employee's workflow in order to do that process on the t- time-driven schedule. But the manual is the key. So the third prong approach to that is how am I going to do that task going forward? It's not, are we going to run to this target every time we're out of diapers or soy milk? It's, I need the decision-making process, the authority, the credit card, the checkbook, and the time to go get in an efficient system so that I don't have to have this conversation with you again. So then the magical aspect of domestic service, when you get into estate management, when you get into these upper echelons of um, professionalization and standardization in private service is that the diapers and the soy milk magically appear in the places that they're meant to be in the household forevermore because the owner is giving them the authority to make that decision happen, you know, and then um, it's in a system, it's in the manual. And this is the methodology that we're going to use for our particular household, even though it's idiosyncratic, it's like they get the seal of approval. And every time we get down to a third low on X, Y, Z, I give you the authority to go to the store and make it happen. And then she doesn't have to make that decision anymore. So that I think wipes out like 80% of the challenges because we've written it down, we've we've articulated the issue. And then it's like, okay, even though it's this one-off nuanced thing, then the even better, the, the estate manager that's even more seasoned and understands this, or the domestic worker that's even more seasoned and understanding how to navigate this question is they're going to say, does this rule apply to all shopping? Or does this rule apply to all calendar management? Or how can I then go the third mile and make a better decision for you going forward so that we don't have to have this conversation again? So the weekly, monthly emails will become more um, enticing to that estate manager or the estate owner that doesn't necessarily want to show up for her periodical conversations. And she'll be like, wow, these are really effective. She's asking really intuitive questions. The estate worker like is understanding me now. So then she's going to be more excited to delegate more and they're going to have a more effective communication process because the system is working for her. So I would train the domestic worker and the owner on that. And then um, the next question you were talking about, I'm sorry, what was your part B on that? When a problem does arise. Um, in oh, the scripting. Communication. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's difficult. I mean, I, I think we might have to have a whole other, um, communication part B on just, um, navigating, um, challenges, uh, in the interpersonal relationship between a domestic worker and the owners, um, and how to navigate all of that. It's different for every owner. It's conflict management, conflict resolution. Um, so if, if you haven't taken away anything from what I'm saying today, I think that um, the most important thing we can all do in the domestic service industry is forget that we are, it's two sides of the coin, forget that we're in domestic service, but also realize that we're in domestic service. So on the one hand, I want us all to theorize it back to self-help books and back to literature and back to um, business professionalization that is out there because the literature is out there. If we just apply those same concepts to the domestic service environment, we can raise the level of professionalism for everyone. At the same time, that's only 80% of it because the 20% is idiosyncratic. And so how do we navigate the inner complexities of the work environment which we're in because it is unique only to domestic service. But um, if you think about literature on leadership and business practices and communication, there is things in Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all of these wonderful business self-help books that give us directives on how to navigate some of these things but we haven't tuned into that because it's not directed specifically for our industry. So this is why I love to pull out those little nuggets of truth and help people think about professionalization in the domestic service environment in the same way. So I would look up some like crucial conversations is a great book. Um, And you can start there and maybe we'll have another webinar myself or someone else with engine hire on, um, on those workplace challenges. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you. We we'll, we have a couple more minutes. Does anyone else have a burning question, or um, we can wrap up with some final thoughts? You know, I think we just have three minutes left. I think it's best uh, 
to just, uh, you know, share more about yourself, Jennifer, and where people can learn more about you. Well, thank you so much. So I love all of the brainstorming aspect of this. This is what lights me up because really I'm an alms bed person. I'm like a therapist when I go into these households and everyone's frustrated and there's high emotions. And so what I can do is help to kind of disseminate all of that um, and create some clarity of process and communication and thoughts so that everything runs more efficiently because my heart is for these families. Um, and there really is no other world in which we work <laughs> other than private service. So I love what I do. It's the reason why I opened my own consulting practice in order to go in and create these systems for change. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so what I do is I go in a week at a time. Um, I do a referral bonus with the agent that brings me in and I will work directly with that family um, through that agency if there's a change that is needed in the staffing. So I think that that's important for you all to know is that sometimes owners will um, buck a recommendation that you're giving them like, oh, you need two housekeepers. And they're like, we don't need two housekeepers. You're just trying to sell us on another placement. Well, if I go in and I actually say based on formality levels and functionality levels, you do need two housekeepers or more, or, you know, for the square footage of what they're trying to um, process, I can then be the voice of reason helping you make an additional placement in that household that's going to take the pressure off of everyone. So that's a big benefit of having an outside um, operational assessment come in and do that consulting practice because we're actually able to see um, what it is that the family needs. And the, the family may not be articulating the needs for your um, domestic worker effectively, but um, let's say, you know, they, they, they say, well, we need another nanny. Well, they may not need another nanny. Maybe they just need a morning rush driver and an afternoon rush driver. I placed some really successful mom's helper nannies um, in that AM and PM time slot um, when they're just trying to get the kids out the door and breakfast made and get them to soccer practice and get them to school on time and all of those types of things. Um, and so then they're able to save money. Everybody's happier with the schedule. So there's a lot of um, creativity that can happen with the staffing process if you're on site. And so I love to go in and I just do a week at a time that then the client will pay me directly. Um, I give the agency a referral bonus for every successful contract that um, a client will sign based on the agency's recommendations. Um, and then I have that um, hand-holding assistance with you and the family for that ongoing relationship going forward. Maybe I go in twice a year, maybe I go in once a year um, to just help them shore up that commu those communication and those operational challenges. So you can reach me on my website. My website is Luxury Lifestyle Logistics. Um, that's www.luxurylifestylelogistics.com. Um, and I am on the board of Private Service Alliance. I want to thank Natalie Hudson for joining us today. Um, and she, uh, again, and myself are very passionate about raising standards for the entire domestic service industry. So I'm so pleased to be here with you all. Agencies are the front line of defense in all of these complexities. And so I, um, my hats are off to you and engine hire um, for what you do because I would not want to be in your shoes. Placement is so challenging and so dif difficult and you all are so passionate about it. So I'm truly, truly grateful that you are working in this environment on behalf of um, households and domestic workers to help it be a more hom harmonious environment for everyone. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us and sharing thank all of you. your wisdom with everyone. Once, uh, just like ASAP, we're going to, you know, put this recording in our learning center with everything, uh, all the links to Jennifer and more. Um, so yeah, everybody, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you ever have a question. Um, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on, um, you know, via email. So I'm always happy to just um, have a conversation with my fellow um, service professionals in the industry. So don't ever hesitate to reach out if you ever need anything. It's been a pleasure talking with you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Take care.